In this video, I aim to spend 100 days in Terra's most difficult seed. This merges every single secret seed into one. I will also be trying as many new weapons, reworks, and other awesome features in this 1.4.4 update. Since this challenge scales difficulties up by one tier, this means I'll also be playing on the new legendary difficulty. I've also hit a secret $10 Steam code somewhere in this video as a little thank you for almost 10,000 subscribers. If you find it first, it's all yours. And with that being said, let's get into it. On day one, we can see that we spawn in hell. My first goal was to gather some wood to make some ashwood armor. This provides me with small defense against all the legendary difficulty enemies and has a unique set bonus of reducing lava damage. And after that, I head over to explore this seed. How difficult can this be? Yeah, this isn't going to be fun. I spent some of the early days just exploring caves, gathering chests, hearts, materials, just to gear up as fast as possible. And after exploring a small chunk above spawn, I decided it would be a good idea to build a little wall around spawn. You know, to block the enemies from one shot. And after that, I did some epic inventory management. And as soon as I was about to finish, a blood moon spawned. I swear blood moons had an increased chance on this seed. It was so miserable. I just built a little box where I could safely hit enemies. Sadly, I didn't get any loot, but the money was nice. And on day 4, I head further to the crimson vine in order to cheese some better equipment. I got the Panic Necklace, which is a decent survivability accessory, and the Undertaker, which allows the arms dealer to move in. This is super important in this seed, as NPC happiness does not matter, meaning any combinations of NPCs will sell you pylons and all their loot. So for day 5 to 7, I built some NPC housing in the desert biome, mushroom biome, and snow biome. And with this setup, it will allow me to travel different areas of the world in case I died, which in this playthrough will happen a lot. I also killed my first Mimic which was cool, and yes, they spawn in pre-hard mode. Instead of hard mode drops, Mimics in pre-hard mode will drop the basic accessories and items that you would normally expect to find in chests. I'm back to harvesting trees for more resources on day 10, and I decided it was smart to venture towards the surface when I got the dreaded notification. With my extremely limited loadout, this was not going to be an easy fight. However, I do have a lot of experience finding this boss. The trick is just to keep your distance and run in a straight line back and forth. One perk of this seed was that it was always going to be night time, which means these nocturnal bosses won't despawn if the time runs out. This was going to be a massive advantage for me, as this fight took around 15 minutes in real time. And after an exhausting battle, I finally managed to defeat my first boss, and I definitely didn't die after. This gave me access to the Cthulhu Shield, which in my opinion is probably one of the most OP accessories. It grants you a dash, which is critical for dodging high damaging enemy attacks. For day 13, I did some more exploring. And day 15, more exploring. I found the stylus day 16, but it didn't have anything useful, but it gave me the ability to expand my pylon network even further. I also decided to explore the surface. It was extremely hard, and the mob spawn rate was absolutely insane. The jungle temple also spawned up here, which was strange considering that in normal terraria, they are buried deep within the underground jungle. I also did a dive into the ocean before recalling back to my shack. Don't worry, we'll be upgrading this base soon. I headed over to the desert on day 17, just to gather some more resources and explore the seed a bit more. Bar statues were extremely helpful for an extra 5 defense and also found the storm spear, a pretty decent melee weapon. I also decided to mine some more gold to get enough for some gold armor. Yes, platinum is slightly better, but I found more gold, so yeah, work with what you got. With our newly upgraded gear, I headed over to the mushroom biome to hunt for the shroomerang. In Terraria 1.4.4, they added a new weapon, the trimerang, and I wanted to test it out. After a satisfying bat time lapse, I had all the components to make it, and it looks so good. One thing I wish they did was transfer the frostburn effect to the trimerang. With my new weapon, I decided it was time to challenge King Slime. So I flattened out an area next to my base, and as I was finishing up, another blood moon happened. Anyways, with our new gear, it was time. It was kinda weird seeing how big this boss was compared to vanilla, but it was pretty easy. Sadly, I didn't get the slimy saddle from the boss, but the royal gel makes my life so much easier in hell making the lava slimes all friendly. On day 21, it was finally time to construct my new base. Now, I'm not a particularly good builder, but I'll try to channel my inner chaos and see what I come up with. I decided to build sort of like a castle, but honestly, I was just winging it. After the initial shape and structure of the house was built, I filled in the walls with a pretty basic design and also made some iron bars for little windows. After my base was done for now, I headed over to make a small herb farm for some potions when the goblin army was approaching. Yeah, cue the death montage. After the goblins were slain, I headed over to explore the new ether bike 
which is a magical place found on the jungle side of your world underneath the ocean bite. This was extremely cool and has some awesome features where you can throw items in and it will transform it into something else. I couldn't really do anything with this biome at the moment, so I just went exploring underneath using the new shimmer. More exploring later, I also ran into a pretty rare creature, the Nymph, which dropped the metal detector. Our journey continues day 28, where I further explore the jungle biome. I decided that this spot was going to be perfect for the jungle pylon, and as I was building the box, I saw the goblin nearby, so I headed over to free him. This NPC is definitely a scam artist, but probably one of the most useful, giving you reforges and access to accessory upgrades. I built more little houses for NPCs to move in. And with that, went to explore the desert pyramid, which surprisingly had no traps inside. This chest gave me the sandstorm in a bottle, which will be a huge boost to our mobility, and also the pharaoh costume, which is absolutely useless. I decided it was time to fight another boss, the Brain of Cthulhu, and boy was that a mistake. Usually this fight is pretty easy, strategy was just to throw grenades until it died, but its second phase was so annoying. It flips the gravity of the player, and gravitation potions do not work either, making the fight extremely difficult to dodge, and really annoying. Death after death. I actually died so many times that I had enough materials from the creepers to make the crimtain armor without the need to defeat the boss. And even with better gear, I still died. After completely giving up on the Brain of Cthulhu, I chugged an obsidian skin potion and went mining day 32 for some hellstone to make molten equipment. A cool trick to quickly farm obsidian is by duping water over a lava lake. After gathering all the materials, I made some molten armor, which provided me with extra defense and melee boost. Feeling a bit overconfident, I headed over to the dungeon, which in this seed actually was buried underneath some living wood trees, which is pretty cool. I made a simple arena and cursed the old man. Yeah, I know I could have mined these blocks over here, but I totally forgot to make a molten pickaxe. Anyway, the fight is probably what you expected. I just wanted to do a bit of limit testing, if you know what I mean. Back to the normal progression, I headed over to the jungle day 37 and made a big arena with dynamite. As I was building, the traveling merchant spawned, and I discovered something unique about this seed, which are items that have been swapped around. For example, the key brand, which is a hard mode sword, was sold by the traveling merchant in pre-hard mode. The stats were nerfed, but it's a little cool feature. Back to finishing off my arena, and it was time to fight Queen Bee. As long as you have good vertical mobility, the bee saw accessory will also be useful to remove the poison effect. I do admit that the weapon of choice could have been a lot better, as it was difficult to use the boomerangs on a fast boss like Queen Bee. After a defeat, I headed back to base. I got the bee's knees and bee nades from the treasure bag, which are amazing crowd control weapons, which spawn friendly bees on attack. I also decided to craft the High 5 Yo-Yo, a new weapon added in 1.4.4. I spent day 40 doing some fishing in honey in order to get honey fins, which are the best healing potions possible in pre-hard mode. On day 42, it was finally time to re-challenge Skeletron, this time remembering to mine out the dungeon bricks. I mainly use the new yo-yo as it synergizes very well with my molten armor, provides me with a more reliable ranged melee weapon. In this fight, you want to do a basic circular dodge pattern, however one unique attack was the spawning of the dark casters. This one little change made the fight way more difficult, turning the boss into a more of a bullet hell, and being hit by one of these casters could be absolutely deadly, as you risk being knocked into a spinning skull. Anyways, after some time, Skeletron was finally defeated, giving me a surprisingly comfortable couch, and also the reworked bone glove which is now an accessory that fires bones every time a weapon is used. After a quick inventory management session at base, it was time to explore the dungeon. If you haven't noticed while inside, the dungeon is extremely dark, which is quite annoying and more challenging to explore. These were my main goals for the dungeon. All of these just require some exploration around the dungeon and getting enough gold keys to unlock the chest. My first chest was the Cobalt Shield, which would be useful for the Armor Shield upgrade later on. I also found the Alchemy Table, which was going to be helpful at reducing the cost of ingredients for my buffs. I also found the Shadow Key, allowing me to explore the Underworld more and unlock some Shadow Chests. And after some deaths, I finally found the Muramasa and the Bewitching Table, giving me an extra summoning slot, effectively boosting my overall DPS. Another interesting drop was the Bubble Gun, a normally post Duke Fishon drop, now available pre-hard mode but heavily nerfed, which meant that the Aqua Scepter was probably now post Duke Fish on, which is pretty funny. After a successful dungeon trip, I used the bones to craft the Void Bag. With the Mirror Master, it also meant that I could make the Knight's Edge, probably one of the most awesome reworks in this update. I spent the rest of Day 45 opening as many Shadow Chests as I could, giving me access to Life Force Potions and other goodies as well. And on day 46, I began my wall of flesh and hard mode preparations. I first made some temporary housing just to get some NPCs spawning. 
If you want to copy it, these are the dimensions. However, I know that you could make this a bit cheaper if you really wanted to. Next up, I used the magic conch and headed back to the ender biome to transmute some permanent power-ups to be as strong as possible. The mana crystal transmute into the arcane crystal, providing permanent mana regen. The life crystal turns into the vital crystal, providing permanent health regeneration. Any food item gives you the ambrosia, boosting mining and building speed. I also did a lot of fishing for some rage potions and heart reach. Then on day 49, I opened all my crates for my fishing session and made the amphibian boots, providing me with increased jump and movement speed. And then I spent the rest of the day building the dreaded Wall of Flesh Arena, probably one of the most unfun things ever. I also decided to build a couple mob farms, using a bunch of dynamite to create a large area. For those who want a blueprint of what my farm design will look like, here it is. Following creating a large space, I plan out the AFK platform, and after that, I make my spawning platforms, which will be swapped between Crimstone and Pearlstone in hard mode. Then I pour a layer of lava at the bottom of my box to ensure mobs don't spawn underneath, and it can ruin the max mob count. You can also place a bunch of walls to get the same effect, but I found this lava method to be significantly faster. Next up is setting up the teleporter for easy access between my home base and the AFK farm, and setting up dart traps in order to attract the mimics. And finally, some station buffs and extra storage. And that's about it. Pretty simple and very effective. Trust me when I say this, building this in pre-hard mode will save you so much time, as you don't have to deal with the difficult enemies in hard mode. Looking back, usually on a normal seed, you'd want to build this in the cavern layer, around lava. However, something that I learned about this seed is that it is upside down, so I probably should have built this towards the surface in order to get other enemies to spawn. Continuing preparations, I expanded my storage in order to collect all the new weapons that I'll be getting in hard mode, and also create a farm for the jungle biome. This will follow the exact same process as before, so I'll just skip to the end. One change I made to this farm was added a little more mud blocks to force the biome state to jungle. I also decided it was finally time to get my revenge on the brain of Cthulhu, and with the knight's edge, I made quick work of the boss. One tip I discovered was that standing still in its second phase, and not moving too much, was actually the key to beating this boss all along. In the remaining of day 57, I spent exploring the Sky Islands. The shiny red balloon will be my final piece to make the yellow horseshoe balloon further boosting my mobility for the wall of flesh fight. And the star fruit, which is a piece for the zenith crafting tree. And after some final preparations, it was finally time to challenge the wall of flesh and unleash the evil spirits in this world. I dropped the voodoo doll, and this was probably the hardest boss in legendary mode. The boss itself isn't that difficult at all, but the fire imps it spawns can be absolutely fatal, dealing upwards of 100 damage per hit. My general strategy was to spam water bolts. And while I was low on mana, I would switch to the Phoenix Blaster to deal with the imps. It was so important that you focus on dodging the fireballs more than the actual Wall of Flesh lasers, as it could ruin your run. During this part of the boss fight, he went over my base, which allowed me to reset my cake buff and get a cheeky heal from the nurse. And after a long drawn out battle, I was victorious. And with that, hallowed and corruption began to spread in my world, and hard mode begins. And I ran into my first hard mode mimic. A blood moon also occurred during the boss battle, so I decided to use this time to test out the farm that I made earlier. Opening the Wall of Flesh treasure bag, I got the all-important demon heart, giving me an additional accessory slot, bringing my total up to 7. I went to the Ether Biome day 59 to collect some Pearlstone blocks, and also converted my previous summoner emblem to a ranger emblem, using the awesome Shimmer Liquid. Using these Pearlstone blocks, I'm able to convert my AFK farm into a Hallow, giving me easy access to hard mode materials such as pixie dust, unicorn horns, and souls of light. What was strange was that there are no illuminate enemies that spawn here. I know you need to be behind natural wall and also moving, but he also didn't spawn either. It might be because of the depth in this seed is different than vanilla terraria, but let me know in the comments if you know the actual reason. Collecting my spoils, I saw that the wand of sparking drop, whereas in a normal seed, this would spawn on surface chests and be kind of useless. This variant was super buff and has high damage and fire rate. After the farming session, it was time to break some altars. I spent days 60 to 62 speedrunning through the lower tier hard mode ores, then went to mine Mithril, found the Bound Wizard, and another Blood Moon. And after the Blood Moon, the pirates decided to invade. I just can't seem to get a break. Anyways, continuing on my journey, I went back to mining, and made the Adamantite Forge and armor sets. Yes, I know titanium can be slightly better, but I found way more adamantite and decided to screw it. Adamantite is for giga chads. I spent a little titanium that I had making a repeater, and then I would use this to farm some more hallowed mimics. And six mimics later, I finally got the Daedalus Stormbow. And with holy arrows, it was time to kill some wyverns for some souls of flight. And with that, my first pair of wings were achieved. 
I then converted my artificial hallow biome into a crimson one on day 63, so I could safely farm souls of night and crimson mimics as well. With the OP dart pistol and crystal dart combo, I was ready to farm for the rotted discord. Since illuminate enemies couldn't spawn in my original farm, I just made a quick farm near the shimmer biome where I knew that they were spawning. I followed the exact same blueprint as showed earlier in its purest form, just a large area with lava underneath. And with the farm built, it was time to grind. It took nearly two terraria days, which is around 48 minutes in real time, until it finally dropped. I will say that the biome torches and gnome probably increased my luck a lot. With the rod of discord and fully geared out equipment, it was finally time to challenge the mechanical trio, Mechdusa, which is basically the destroyer, twins, and skeleton prime, all merged into one. I decided it would be best to fight this boss above ground. Even with the annoying gravity effect, I would have significantly more space to dodge. I spent all day blowing up the ground and setting up a long runway. I also tested the temple hoik bug in this update, and yes, it still works. You can enter the jungle temple without the temple key. Anyways, with the arena preparations finishing off, it was time to use Okram's Razor and challenge Magdusa. This boss is extremely challenging on legendary mode, but with the right preparations, it should be pretty straightforward. I highly recommend Heart Crystals, Honey Pools, and other arena buffs. High mobility accessories such as Amphibian Boots are great, and for weapons, any long range piece weapons will be good at taking down the Destroyer first. Remember that there's no time limit for the bosses they spawn. After that, it was just a game of circling around the boss until you can take out the twins. And with the twins dead, Skeleton Prime should fall shortly after. And now, the jungle will grow restless. Opening all three treasure bags, I obviously got my souls, but I also luckily got a developer set by Senex, which was pretty neat. I also upgraded to the True Knight's Edge, which looks amazing with this update. And then I crafted the Hallow set, giving me the crucial Shadow Dodge set bonus. With the current loadout setup I'm aiming for, it's focused at damage avoidance rather than damage reduction. Due to legendary modes high stat bloating, outright dodging attacks, especially from bosses, are way more valuable than reducing its damage. And then on day 68, it's time for a quick horror fight gathering session, and to collect some life fruit to max out our life for a total of 600. I also spent this time killing Magdusa again for some extra materials, so I could craft the true Excalibur, and be one step closer to the Terror Blade. I also found a new upgrade with the Extractinator, combining Chlorify, which converts Seal and Slush into hard mode ores, which is a pretty cool feature. I spent the night at the AFK farm hunting for the Sanguine Star, which would heavily boost our current summon damage. And with our new equipment, it was pretty simple to beat. And I just gotta say, the visual effects on these reworks are so good. I spent day 70 upgrading my base to the next level, adding a rooftop section and an area to display my armors. I also added this lava feature throughout the base, which I thought looks pretty cool. One trick I learned from Chaos was this building pattern using Palladium Pillars, which looks absolutely beautiful and adds so much more depth to the overall build. And that was basically the build finish. Finishing off day 70, I remember I could shimmer life fruit into Aegis fruit, which would increase my defense value by an extra 4. And then on day 71, I prepared my dungeon farm before defeating Plantera. If you didn't know, the dungeon walls can be converted into cursed versions, meaning if we just replace the blocks at our original farm with the cursed walls, we could have an artificial dungeon biome. You know when you got it right when the music starts to change? and it becomes dark. I also decided to build a crimson key farm for the vampire knives. This farm is also very simple. It works by forcing the biome state to the jungle, which allows these fishies to spawn, and since they are also in the crimson, gives us a chance to obtain a crimson key. And while I let the jungle seeds grow, it was time to challenge Plantera. It has a unique attack compared to vanilla, of spawning damaging vines and its seedlings constantly respawn, making it extremely difficult to kill the boss. I actually died in my first attempt, but on the second try with a little more preparation and the basic circling technique, I got it into its second phase. The light discs feel amazing, and the true knight's edge's piece attack makes the second phase so much easier. And after a bit of time, the plant was finally destroyed and the temple is officially unlocked. And that means more difficult dungeon enemies are spawning. Luckily for us, we already set up this AFK dungeon farm, which means we can safely sit here and not suffer from the difficult mobs one-shotting us. My main priorities are the Tabby and Black Belt from Bone Lee, the Paladin's Hammer, and Apple Pies for major welfare buffs. And on day 74, after some light farming, I head over to the dungeon and unlock the Hallow Chest, giving me the Rainbow Gun. This fires a continuous rainbow stream and was heavily buffed in this update. Then I head to the temple and entered the proper way. My goal was to get some solar tablets to summon the solar eclipse. 
Maneuvering through the temple was so much harder. It was so dark and there's a new feature where wiring is disabled until you defeat Golem, meaning you can't just use wire cutters to easily breeze through the temple. Then to prepare for the solo eclipse, I also wanted to get the Crimson Key. The jungle grass from my key farm that I built earlier has finally grown all the way and now these fishies will start to spawn. I got extremely lucky as on my 150th one, I went to check on the loot that I got and saw the jungle key along with the crimson key. And after a quick trip to the dungeon, the vampire knives are finally mine. On day 75, it was finally time to summon the solo eclipse to unlock some more useful weapons. After defeating Mothron, I was rewarded with the broken hero sword, the final component to making the terror blade. And after some quick reforging, I went to test the new rework Terror Blade on the Pumpkin Moon. I love the new visual effects and the huge area of effect damage makes invasions like this so much easier. And it was finally time to challenge Golem. I made sure to heavily light up the area and since wires don't work here, I made a big brain move and placed the heart statues outside the temple and used the heart reach potion to get the hearts. Then finally made the arena flat to make sure I wouldn't get stuck on anything while dodging. Golium is notorious for being one of the easiest bosses in Terraria. And yes, even though he was given boss in this update, and made harder with the darkness effect and small size, it wasn't enough and it remained pretty simple to defeat. The rainbow gun paired with the terror blade provided excellent DPS and the vampire knives were used to quickly heal me back up in case I got too low. As I explained earlier, the triple dodge loadout is extremely helpful and will be even more valuable as we progress to more challenging bosses with high contact damage. Day 77, I spent more time farming golems until I got the sandstone, the final component to making the celestial shell, which will give me buffs to almost all my stats. I won't be upgrading to the beetle armor, but the beetle wings will give me a nice movement speed boost. I also built a simple Duke Fishron arena, and after some truffle worm collecting, I was ready to take on this boss. Duke Fishron is pretty challenging, but with the dodged loadout that I have, it nullifies most of his devastating attacks. For phase 3, from my experience with Fargo's eternity mode, I basically knew this attack band inside and out. However, one thing I didn't account for was this damn wyvern that spawned and absolutely destroyed my first attempt. Second attempt though was a lot better. Duke Fishron's phase 3 cycles through a certain amount of dashes. So his pattern is that he will dash once, then teleport, dash twice, then teleport, then dash three times and teleport, and he repeats this cycle. Knowing this pattern makes it so much easier to time your dashes, and with that, another boss down. What I'm hoping for are the fish on wings, which are the best available wings pre-moon lord. And with my dream luck activated, I got it on my first go, meaning no more wasted time farming for it. The tempest stuff was also nice, providing me extra DPS on my summons. I also took this time to defeat Queen Slime because I totally forgot about this boss. I also had no clue how to summon the Empress of Light. Usually they spawn on the surface hallow at night time. I even checked the underground hallowed on day 83 near my rotted discord farm. The steampunker also doesn't sell the clantamator in this seed. So if you guys know how to summon Empress on this seed, it would be much appreciated. And one solo eclipse later on day 84, it was time to start the end game. I first prepared my moon lord arena that will expand through most of the world. Since I don't want to risk dying in space and the effect of low gravity, I also used a lot of dynamite to lower the ground level. After finishing off the runway, I also made a quick teleporter system to easily travel between my base and the surface and finished it off with some arena buffs. I spent day 88 checking off a couple more bosses I missed such as Deerclops, Torch God and the Eater of Worlds. I also found a gold bunny which was pretty cool. I placed him on the top of my base and I think that looks pretty nice. Day 90 I decided to challenge the Frost Moon for two ranged weapons. The Chain Gun paired with Chlorify Bullets is amazing for the Lunatic Cultists and also the elf melter. After some quick money making and reforge sessions, I decided to test these weapons on the Martian Madness event. I didn't really need anything important, but it was nice just to test out my damage on some strong enemies. It was time to defeat the lunatic cultists on day 94 and start the celestial invasion. I decided just to fight him in my old skeleton arena because of the low gravity on the surface was pretty annoying. This boss was relatively easy, just make sure you don't hit the clones or else the cultists will summon minions that are absolutely fatal on legendary mode. The trick to distinguish the clones from the real one is to look at his hat and the white pixel in his eyes. After some time, the cultists will fall and the celestial pillars will spawn. Usually on normal seeds, these pillars spawn on the surface. However, on this zenith seed, they are buried underground. In my opinion, this actually makes the pillars slightly easier. You could do these pillars in any order, but I decided with this. The Stardust Pillar will give me access to the amazing Stardust Dragon Summon. It will carry me for the rest of the pillars. If you want a cool trick to easily beat the Stardust Pillar, 
Lure two starter cells outside the range of the pillar. Then once you kill them, it will cause the cells to split. And if you wait for them to go back, you can infinitely kill the starter cells from a safe area until the shield is broken. And with that, one pillar down. Next up was the Vortex Pillar, and I wanted to do this one second to get the Vortex Buddha ranged weapon, which will most likely be my main choice for the Moon Lord fight. With my Stardust Dragon Staff, and using the same strategy as the Stardust Pillar, I sniped off enemies until the barrier was down. Day 98, I continued my Pillars grind, taking on the Nebula one next. I didn't have a strategy for this, but it was pretty easy considering we have the Celestial weapons already. And with 100 Nebula enemies down, the third pillar was finally defeated. Only the solar one remained. The solar pillar grind continued until day 99. Surprisingly, the solar pillar wasn't actually that difficult due to it being underground and most of the enemies couldn't really get to me. After the defeat of the last pillar, the impending doom approaches and day 100 begins, the final boss. I quickly rushed back to base with all my fragments to make the super healing potion. I teleported to my arena on the surface and after one flashbang, Moon Lord has spawned. This was the loadout I was going to use which focused on having high dodge chance since the Moonlord does extremely high damage, and being able to dodge his attacks will be critical in defeating this boss. For weapons, any good long range tracking weapon will work fine, and I must say, the Rotter Discord was insanely helpful at dodging the fatal laser attack. In this seed, the Moonlord will actually shoot out a high damaging bouncy boulders after his giant laser attack, making it extremely dangerous to stay close to. With the epic battle fantasy music pumping, and sometime later, the Moonlord was no match for me. This was 100 days in Terraria's Zenith Sea in Legendary Mode. That's it for now. Goodbye.